Hey, this is Kyle from EssentialDeveloper.com. In this video, you will learn how to write clean tests and avoid a common exit test mistake. So let's go. So recently, I talked to a senior developer that was confused about why a test was not failing. So let me show you the problem. So I have an empty project here. Let me create a unit test case class. Let's call it sample test. So as you can see, the exit test case template comes with a bunch of methods and comments, and I'm not going to remove it for now because it's important to illustrate the problem. So let me show you what he was trying to do. So let's imagine we have a class. Let's call it sample. Let's say it has some state. Let's say it's an integer and it has a method. Let's say change state. And for this example, let's just add one. So every time we call this method, we add one to the state, which alters the state. Perfect. Now imagine that in the class scope, we create an instance of sample. Then we call sample.change state and we assert that the state should be one. Let me run the test. Any pass. Okay. Now let's create another test. And if we call change state again, the change state should not be one because we call change state already in another method. If we call it again, this should be two. But it is one. So that's pretty much the behavior the senior developer was trying to replicate. He was trying to prove that sharing state in the test is a bad idea. And it is, but he couldn't replicate it because if you said here one, the test passes and he was surprised by that. And actually many developers are surprised by this because this is a class property. It is shared in the class scope for all the methods. Well, at least it looks like it is shared, but it's not. So the problem is many developers don't know how the test case classes are created, how the test methods are invoked and what is the test case class lifecycle and why it is this way. And I believe that part of the problem is that the way people learn how to use exit test case, the common way to set up your code is to create your objects in the setup method and then deallocate it in the teardown method. And as you can see in the comment here, it says this method is called before the invocation of each test method in the class. And it feels like this is the wrong setup to create a let property because you don't want to share the state between tests. So the common way is to set the sample to be a var of type sample, initiate it in the setup, and deallocate it in the teardown. But for this to be possible now, we need to make the sample property either optional or for some rapid with a bang. And if we write code like this, we feel like for each invocation of each test method, we're going to have a new instance of the sample class. And that's true. But this setup has the same behavior as before. So exit test has a somewhat weird design, very similar to the JUnit approach, where each test method is invoked in a separate instance of the test case class, which means if we have, in this case, two test methods, the exit test framework is going to create two instances of the test case class and invoke only one method per instance. And if we add another method, exit test now is going to create three instances and invoke only one method per instance. And there is nothing wrong with this design. But why did they do it like this? Well, it's actually for a good reason. Running individual test methods in separate instances are meant to avoid sharing state between tests. It's actually a good design choice. The problem is that it's not obvious. It is very counterintuitive when compared with how we're used to use objects to share state between methods. So let me prove that to you. If we print here the object identifier for self, which is the instance of the simple test case class, this should be invoked before each test method and it should have different identifiers, which means it's a different instance. Let me run this. 
Okay, let's have a look. As you can see, that identifier for the first instance ended in 09E0. And the second time it executed the setup, it has a different identifier. It's a different instance with identifier 3980. There you go. Every test method is invoked in a separate instance of the test case. So if that's the case, why do we need the setup and teardown? Well, most of the times, yes, we don't need it. And we can just create in the class scope and guarantee that every invocation of the test methods will have a separate instance of the subject under test. But when you are testing a class or a cluster of objects together, you also want to know that when you deallocate the object, nothing bad happens. Because imagine you have now a crash in the application when you deallocate the object or the cluster of objects for any reason. So it's important when you're testing to be able to test the full life cycle of your object. That's why in the teardown, we remove our strong reference to the instance. So if there's anything wrong, we're going to be notified. Let me simulate, for example, a crash in the deinit. Great, let me run. As you can see, we get a crash. Great, now let's get rid of this. So other things we can do in the setup and teardown is to restate some kind of database before each test or after each test, any kind of global shared state that you need to control. But most of the times we want to avoid global state, so this shouldn't be a big problem, but setup and teardown is a good use case for global state setup. For example, in the teardown, you can clean up core data. So when you execute other tests, they are not influenced by previous side effects. But when we are talking about the subject under test, we actually don't need to use the setup and teardown like this. So if you follow our videos, you probably notice that we approach the tests setup differently. Right? So we have done the setup teardown dance many times, but we noticed that moving that code, the setup code and teardown code, to factory methods, it would yield better results, in most cases, at least. So let me show you an example. So look at this test for one of the view controllers in our quiz app. As you can see, it has no setup or teardown, but we have this make SUT or system under test or subject under test method that returns the type we are testing. And when the syntax is short enough, we can just inline everything in the assertion. For example, here we create the view controller with a given summary string, and we test that the header label rendered the summary string, for example. And we also render the answers in the result screen. So for example, if I create a view controller with no answers, I expect the table view to have zero rows. But if I have one answer, I expect the table view to have one row. So another task that requires a little bit more setup, for example, here I need to create an answer for a question. Then I create my system under test and I check that I'm rendering the correct answer in my table view. It's pretty self-contained. It doesn't need any external setup or teardown. And as you can see, this test doesn't care about the summary. So I don't need to expose this detail to my test because it's irrelevant. So I keep the setup very consistent and clear. I think this test is pretty easy to understand. So let's have a look at the factory method. As you can see, it has some default values. It creates the view controller, loads the view, and returns it ready to be tested. So why is this important? Specifically for this case, it makes my tests more readable. So if I had a setup and teardown, as I'm reading the test here, I would have to jump to the setup and teardown if I want to know how this object was created if this object is still in memory, if we have to make it optional or for some rapid. But if I keep all the references to this object within the test method, I can guarantee that the strong reference to this instance will be removed at the end of the scope of the method. So for free, I'm getting the deallocation. So the instance will be freed automatically, which means we are testing the whole life cycle of my system under test and all its collaborators as well. We don't need to explicitly set it to nil in the teardown. I think this is more concise. It takes less lines of code to express better the setup. So it's a win-win. And if I decide to move 
the creation to the setup and teardown, since every test has a different setup, I will have to change the design of my production code to allow property injection instead of constructor injection as I'm using here. And since the result view controller is pretty much an immutable class, at least at this point, I can express better my production code and I don't need any trade-off to be able to test it. Otherwise, if I move this to the setup and teardown methods and I need to change the setup for each test, I would either have to create it manually in my test again or I'll have to make the setters public. And I don't want that. I think I can express better my production domain this way. I don't need to change my production code to accommodate a testing framework. I think that's another big win. And I really like this style of given, when, then, where the test methods control all the setup in a very clean and concise way. Short scopes for tests, it makes it much more maintainable. And that's pretty much how we write tests at Essential Developer. And we really like it. We've had some very good results with it. And to be clear, we avoid the setup and teardown because most of the times it's unnecessary and we believe the factory method can be a better approach to it. And it also doesn't make you think about the weird exit test design where every method is invoked with a different instance because all the test setup lives in the test method. So you don't even need to think about shared state. Everything is inside the method and it goes away when the method scope ends. But there are valid use cases for the setup and teardown, as we said, resetting database states, setting up some crazy singletones or any global states that you need to set up and then reset afterwards. And since those global state setups are just details, they have nothing to do with the test, it's better to keep it separate in the setup and teardown methods. So to finish off, we'd like to know your opinion about this approach. Were you surprised by the exit test design? Maybe you've been writing tests for a long time and you didn't know that. In my case, I learned about it after about like three years of writing tests and I was somehow surprised. I was always avoiding shared state, but I didn't know that most of the times the framework was already doing that for me. And we would like you to be proactive and think about the problems you are facing so you can find a better solution for you. So don't forget to be critical and let us know in the comments your preferred approach. So we hope you enjoyed this video and learned something today. Check the links in the description for more. Don't forget to subscribe and I see you next time. Mm -hmm.